Welcome to Behavior Groups, the podcast that explores stories, science, and secrets from the world's brightest thought leaders in behavioral science. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to investigate the aspects of behavioral science that will improve your well-being, your relationships, and your organization by helping you find your groove. From best-selling authors to researchers, we share insights from the sharpest minds in the world. Okay, Tim, let's just start by getting this out on the table. We are a long, long way from treating men and women equally in our world and in particular in the business world. Oh, very, very true. And while there are those who might argue that men and women are different and it's okay to treat them differently, we need to recognize that there are things that women do in organizations, not because they're better at those things or because they want to do them, but because we simply expect women to do those tasks. Amen, brother. Amen. Our conversation in this episode addresses that, and it's a very special one. It is with Linda Babcock, one of the authors of The No Club, Putting a Stop to Women's Dead End Work. Linda was first on Behavioral Grooves in episode 62 way back in before times in April of 2019. <laughs> and at that point, we talked to her about promoting the careers of women in the workplace. Here we are three years later talking about her very new research on a very similar topic. Yeah. So Linda's research always inspires us to be better organizational citizens, like not for the sake of playing nice in the sandbox or being politically correct, but to improve productivity and profitability of the company, of the organization. As Linda says, it's all about the NPTs. NPTs, those non-promotable tasks. You know, the request from the boss to organize the holiday party or order sandwiches for the team for lunch or being on the IRB review board. Doing those things is nice to do for your organization. And actually, it is really important for the organization. But in most cases, they don't get you promoted. And the problem, Tim, is that women are doing the vast majority of those non-promotable tasks for no other reason than people expect them to do it. Yeah, right, Kurt. And that's at the core of this issue. We talked with Linda about the central issue with non-promotable tasks, which is expectations. It seems that nearly everyone has an expectation that women will do these NPTs. We also discussed what women can do to reduce the number of NPTs in their work life. And Linda provides some excellent tips for our listeners. But we need to direct the conversation properly. This isn't a fix the women discussion. It's no. a fix the organization discussion. Yep. Unless leaders start to model better behavior by not asking women to volunteer for non-promotable tasks and setting up systems to overcome the ingrained tendencies that our companies have established over years, the organizational ecosystems will remain back in the Stone Age. We also spent a few minutes on how Linda and her colleagues wrote the book as a result of founding what they call the No Club. Mm -hmm. In addition to Linda, the No Club includes Brenda Pizer, Lisa Vesterland, and Lori Weingart, all of whom are renowned professors as well. And on this, they all agree. It started with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love that. Most really good things start with a glass of wine, Tim. I just got to say, that's, that's a really good start for most things. We started this conversation off with Linda by jumping right into her new book. Just so you know, we didn't capture a speed round. But with that, we encourage you to sit back and make your own speed round by choosing to have either a glass of wine or a glass of beer and enjoy our conversation with Linda Babcock. Linda Babcock, welcome to Behavioral Groups. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. We are excited to have you back. This is uh, the second time, uh, actually, kind of the third, because you were a joint with George when we did the first, the, you know, the first George Lowenstein one. So we have kind of three times on on this now. So, well, George, you know, he has this research on having liking people liking sequences to improve. So hopefully, this is <laughs> rather than a disappointment. You know, I don't know. That that is absolutely right. We are here to talk about the No Club, putting a stop to women's dead end work that you co-authored with three other fantastic uh, co-authors. Uh, but we're here talking to you and we want to start with just talking about you write about non-promotable tasks that are hiding in plain sight. Maybe could you start 
with telling us what a non-promotable task is, which you refer to as NPTs, and, and why they're, they're hiding in plain sight. Yeah, NPTs. So these are tasks that are important to your organization, but won't help the career of the person who does them. And so they will not show up in your performance evaluation. You might get a, hey, thanks for doing that, but it's never recognized again. And so there are lots of examples in all kinds of organizations of these NPTs. So in academia, you know, the MPTs that we came across as professors were things like sitting on the university committee. You know, my favorite example is the internal review board, which is the board that governs human subjects use on campus. Critical. Like that board shuts down and research shuts down on campus. And yet the people that serve on that committee don't get any recognition for it. But it's a very time consuming task and takes away from the promotable work which is their research and teaching. And you see these in any organization, any organization that has special projects, task force committees, events, parties, people that take notes. You know, we even talked to a bartender who she always gets tasked with training new bartenders. And when she does that, she takes time away from serving customers herself. And so she leaves the evening with fewer tips. And, you know, the owner gives her, hey, thanks for doing that, but no extra pay. And so it it takes away from her promotable task, which is serving customers. And so we found this to be pervasive across organizations, occupations, and industries. And one of the things that you talk about is that, all right, these are sometimes, as you said, you get a pat on the back, you get this all kind of, you know, happy faces and different pieces, but we don't see that these are non-promotable. What makes them so easy to just miss, to not see? Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because... You know, people assume that if my employer asks me to do these things, yeah. they must important and they must matter. But no, these are <laughs> these are tasks where there's no one's job to do these things and they just get added on. I think and it's easy to miss these things because one of the characteristics of MPTs um, is that these things are typically invisible. And so they're often done behind the scenes. You know, no one sees me sitting for hours and hours on on IRB meetings. Um, <laughs> they don't see the work that I'm doing. And so it's, re- it's not recognized. And so that's often why they're so easy to miss. And one of the things that we worry a lot about with the pandemic is that so many people are working now more behind the scenes and remotely. And so many tasks, perhaps, that were promotable once are now actually not promotable because no one sees that this work is associated with you. So you, to try to better understand this, I mean, you, you observe this in, in the wild as Dilip Soman would say, but maybe more importantly, you decided to do some research, you and your colleagues decided to actually do some research into it. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of research that you conducted and what your findings were? Yeah. So when we first started looking to it, you know, the first thing we did was to look around the literature to see what people had done. And there were studies in different industries, you know, small kind of more qualitative studies that really showed that women did more of these non-promotable tasks. And what we really decided we could add to the literature was to understand why, you know, why is it? And lots of our colleagues hypothesized about why women might want to do that. Like, oh, women like these tasks or women are so good at these tasks. And so we thought these were kind of lame explanations. (laughs) But, you know, Agreement kind of, there. Yeah, not, agreement kind of there. Lame. Yeah, seriously we, lame. <laughs> we kind of wanted to really look and investigate it scientifically. You know, were these actual explanations or, or was there something else that, that was happening? So we did some experiments in which we, uh, it's kind of designed on the following situation that I'm sure you see all the time in your work lives. That is, you're sitting in a meeting, someone's leading the meeting and they say, hey, who wants to organize the charity fundraiser? And everybody's like, <laughs> away, looking at their phones, you know, trying to like shuffle papers, looking busy. No one wants to do it. And so who would kind of say, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so we created a situation in the lab where groups of students came in, sat at lab at, at computers. We put them in groups of three and they were asked to play this game for 10 rounds that la- each round was two minutes. And for each group of three, they needed to find a volunteer who would push a button on the computer. That's it. So like women are not better at pushing that button than men. So you know, <laughs> that's not what's going on. And what happens is that at the end of two minutes, if no one pushed the button, they each, each of the three people in the group got a dollar. If someone pushed the button, 
let's say, Tim, you push the button. Then Kurt and I, if we were in a group, we would each get $2 and you would get $1.25. So Tim, you'd be taking one for the team. And so Kurt and I are sitting in the group, like hoping, 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 you know, maybe Tim is going <laughs> to... Um, and so that's basically it. That's, that's what we do. We, they play this over each time they're in a new group and we see who pushes a button. And we find that women are about 50% more likely than men to push that button and take one for oh the team. Gosh. So I don't think they like pushing that button. No one wants to get $1.25 rather than two. They're not better at it. It's just that that people, if there's a woman in a group, you're expecting her to push the button. And me pushing the button is better than getting a dollar because I know you two aren't going to do it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't push the button. And what happens is that, you know, so we find this result, but then we decide, okay, we, we want to learn more about what's going on. And so now we put Tim and Kurt in a, in a group with George Longstein, say. <laughs> so there's three guys. Now, you guys look around, you see that there aren't any women in the group, and you start volunteering. You agree to push the button. And so men are good at pushing the button when they're with other men. Women can push the button, too, when they're with other women. It's just that when women or men are together, men are expecting women to do it. Women, knowing that, go ahead and volunteer. So all boils down to expectations. That, and that expectation, I think, is really interesting is that it's socially kind of construed given all of the history that we've had and all of those different things. Are women asked to do more of the MPTs in addition to just volunteering for them as well? Is that part of that expectation that, that comes out? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think there are two answers. The first part of the question, you know, is about expectations and, you know, that people have this experience and so they're expecting women to do it. But remember, in our study, actually, we've got college freshmen doing this. So they don't have decades of experience in the workforce, and yet they right. have this expectation that women are going to take one for the team. So that's, that's the, the one point. And the second point is that we followed up this study in which we add a, a, a fourth person to the group. So Mary, you're in this group now. One of the people is asked to be the asker. And so you get to ask one of us to, will you push the button? And so what we find in this setup of the game, when there's this fourth person who says, I can ask someone, you're 50% more likely to ask me as a woman rather than one of the guys in the group. And so kind of this double whammy for women, women get asked more and they say yes more. And that's really why they're doing more. And so this we see as the main contribution of our research is to really understand the mechanisms by which women are doing more. You know, they don't like it. They're not better at it, but we expect them to do it. And so we ask them. So gender is clearly a big, it's a big knife that cuts through this. Is, um, are there any other factors? For instance, uh, race, is, is, is race a factor that also influences how, how these decisions are, are made? Yeah, there's some great studies in a research group uh, that Joan Williams works, uh, works on out of Hastings Law School. And they've done... a a lot of surveying in different occupations. They've got um, women in tech, they've got architects, engineers, and lawyers. And they, they ask a lot about workplace situations. And one of the things they ask about is and they don't use the words of non-promotable tasks, but they, they often use the word office housework. And what they find is that not only women are doing more of this office housework, but women of color do more than white women. Um, we really find that race exacerbates it, that um, minority groups are often asked to do this more. And some of the scholars in sociology call this cultural taxation. And so we're taxing underrepresented groups with doing this work. And so it's really hindering their ability to advance with the same opportunities as other people because women of color are overburdened even more than white women with these non-promotable tasks. Yeah. And and the big thing is these non-promotable tasks lend itself over time to people not getting that promotion, not getting the raise, not getting all of those factors that come into it. And you think that you look at that, all right, one year two years, 10 years, 20 years, that can make a huge difference in in how people are doing that. So what can women, what are some tips that you can share with women who find themselves in that situation where maybe they're being asked to uh, do more NPT requests? What what can you do or what can, what kind of hints do you have for them? Yeah. So one of the things we say in our book is a ton of feathers still weighs a ton. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, these things might seem small, like, oh, sure, you're asked to take notes or, or yeah, you're asked to, you know, write this, this report this one time. But those things add up. And as you say, over time, day after day, week after week, year after year, they really are weighing women, women down. And so we have a lot of solutions for organizations that I'm sure we'll talk about later. But in the meantime, we do have lots of advice for women because we lived this for over a decade. You know, the book started because we, five of us banded together to start this, I just can't say no club because we were overwhelmed with this work. We didn't call them NPTs yet. We didn't know what this work was, but we banded together just like a therapy group to help us <laughs> be in control of our time. And over that, during that course of those, those kind of monthly meetings that we had over wine, we learned how to say no better. In fact, um, I brought a little visual. You're not going to be able to see it in the podcast, but I'll, I'll, I'll do some um, sound. For the last time, no. So I have this little <laughs> button that says no on it. It has different no's. Like, no. No. <laughs> um, this is actually something that Richard Thaler sent me. Learning to say no is really important because we often say no the wrong way. And we often give an excuse or, um, you know, we say it badly, you know, like I got caught so many times saying, well, you know, you want me to come give a talk? I can't do it next month. Oh, you know, well, you can do it in three months <laughs> and you know, <laughs> say that you're busy for the rest of your life and you'll never be able to do it. So you have to learn how to say no effectively. So we have a number of things that we, based on research that we looked at in the field, thought were effective ways to say no. One is to help the requester. The requ requester just wants to solve their problem, right? If they have a task that needs to be done, they don't really care about what your excuse is. They need someone to do it. And so the best thing you can do is offer up somebody else. <laughs> um, think about, you know, who actually might be good for that task? Who might it be a promotable task for? And, you know, in our club, of course, we always made sure that we offered up men instead of other women, because we did want to just be passing the buck to other women. And so if you can't actually think of someone who this would be a promotable task for, that solves the person's problem, because that's really what the requester needs is, is to solve their problem. And some of the times we realized we couldn't really say no. You know, it's really hard for me to say no to the provost. Uh, there are other people in your life that you just can't say no to. And so what are the things that you can do saying no, but still having it be positive for you? One of the things you can do is do a trade. Say, you know, I, I can do this, but I need you to take this other thing off my mm. plate. With that other thing being a non-promotable task. You don't want to take the promotable <laughs> stuff off your plate. Take the non-promotable right, stuff off. Right, right. And so, you know, can you relieve me of this other duty? So that's one way. Another way would be maybe you could share the task with someone. Could I get some staff support or can so-and-so help me with this? I'll do it this time if it's reassigned within a month. Someone else takes a turn. Or maybe you, you say, this part of it is really interesting to me. I'd like to do this part, you know, have someone else do this other part. It's, it's maybe not so interesting. So there are lots of ways to even if you have to say yes, to make it better for yourself. Yeah, yeah those yeah. are great. And and I think it's important to to support the women who are reading the book in that way. But as you write, this is not a fix the women book. This is a this is a change the organization book. And and so maybe we could turn to what are the things that you think about in terms of changing the organization? What what can organizations do to help get better at this? Yeah, let, let me first explain a little bit why this isn't a fix the woman book and why the solution doesn't lie with women, okay? So when I resigned from the IRB, the Internal Review Board, that was the bane of my existence, <laughs> uh, who, who got to do it in the department? Julie. So it went to another woman. Of course, it, that's what's expected is that she's going to do it. And so it just kicks the can down the road to someone else and then it's on Julie's plate. So it doesn't really solve problems for women overall. You know, it's also the case, there's some very good research by Madeline Heilman on this, and I've done some research on this as well, that women can face backlash when they say no. And so you don't want to be putting women in a position where you're telling them to say no all the time, and then they, there are really negative consequences for it. And so it's really the organizations that need to change the way they allocate and reward work, especially non-promotable work. And so it is 
paying attention to who you ask. You know, why should Julie be the one to be asked next and why not Danny? And so really to pay attention, am I singling out women for these tasks because I know they're going to say yes? And so really changing that. Organizations can also just look more broadly at their own data to see if they have this inequity. Uh, So I did some work for a very large professional services firm, and they actually keep meticulous track of their time because they bill clients. And so they had, you know, dozens and dozens of codes where you would code every 15 minutes about what you were doing. And this was client work. It was also mentoring work. It was recruiting, all kinds of different things. And they collected this data and they gave me three years of their data on how very senior people actually, and some middle-level people were spending their time. And what we found with this group is that women were spending 200 more hours per year than doing non-promotable work. And they had no idea. And this was work that they themselves had deemed promotable because before we analyzed the data, I said, okay, look at this code. Is this promotable? Is this code promotable? You know, is this way of spending your time promotable? Is this non-promotable? And so they coded all these different things into these categories. And they realized there was this huge inequity. And so if you have this kind of data in your organization, you should look at it uh, to see how big the problem is. And if you don't have that data, maybe you can do something like a data collection effort that would help to identify the problem. Yeah. So let's say some of our our, our listeners out there um, are leaders, and, and some of them are might be men who, who they're listening to this this podcast right now. And they want to change the way that these NPTs get gold out, you know. So to your point, they've they've done look, we looked back three years and we realized this is not working. This is not what we want to do. So so what what do you recommend? What what can they do to get that ball rolling in order to to change that culture? Yeah, there are actually a lot of things that you can do. Some of them are super easy and some of them are a little more challenging. So let me start with the super easy <laughs> part. Stop asking for volunteers. <laughs> what? Is it that? No. Just see, I mean, you... <laughs> that that's going to be something that 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 is going to voice this upon women. And so, you know, my colleague, Lisa Vesterlund, who's one of the co-authors um, of the book at the University of Pittsburgh, when they have promotion meetings, they start out each meeting by saying, hey, who wants to write the report that will be submitted about the candidate and, and our discussion? And it's really important. Yeah. This is super important to the university. It's super important to the candidate. But that is never going to be, you're never going to get a raise for having written this promotion report. They asked for volunteers and women would predominantly do it. Well, because of our work, now they pick names out of a hat. We actually have a picture of they have this big hat and everybody puts their name in it and someone draws a name out of the hat. So that's a very fair method to do it. And so that's easy. Or if it's a task like that, that happens that you have a lot of them, just put it on rotation, okay? So-and-so is going to do it first and then they're up second. Who's going to do it third? And so you're rotating it evenly across um, across people. You know, what could be easier than that? So that's something that can be done immediately. Other things you can do is to reallocate the work so that it's promotable for someone. So for example, one of my other co-authors, Lori Weingart, uh, was organizing a conference at her university and She could have taken on the logistics for organizing it, but it wasn't a very good use of her specialized skills. And so they gave it to an administrative person and they made that person be a conference and logistic organizer. It became promotable for that Mm. person. So you've sort of gotten rid of a non-promotable task and and made it promotable for, for someone else. So that's something else that you can do. More broadly, you can change the way that you reward work. So I was giving a a talk at a a large consulting company a number of years ago, and they were actually in the process of reviewing their performance evaluation procedure uh, when I was there. And so the talk really resonated with them. And what they realized is that mentoring other people and helping other people, those are definitely non-promotable tasks. They're often done behind the scenes. And so no one knows that you did them. And they decided they wanted to make those promotable tasks. And so they set up a system where you would be rewarded for helping others and mentoring others. And so that actually did then affect performance. And so they made this non-promotable task promotable. So those are just some of the solutions that we talk about in the book. We have lots of examples uh, of things that organizations can do. Linda, I think it's really interesting the way that you talk about that, that for one person, the task, the idea of getting the conference ready is a non-promotable task. 
but you can find somebody else who may be in a different position, a different level of the organization, different part of their their tenure, where that task is a promotable task that it now becomes. So it's not necessarily the task itself. It's who gets, um, you know, who volunteers or who gets assigned to it. So I think that's a really great insight. Exactly. You know, I was just having dinner last night with some friends and one of my friends is is a lung transplant surgeon. And he was actually telling me about that he's just bogged down with administrative work and that he doesn't have time to do all the surgeries that are needed, that that the hospital needs him to do. And we were talking about that. And clearly, they're not organizing their allocation of work efficiently. You don't want a guy who's a lung transplant specialist to be spending time doing work that don't utilize his specialized skills. So uh, I think the point is, you know, obviously a a point for women, but for men also more broadly, that organizations should really take a look. Am I using my human capital in the most efficient way? I love those. Those are great examples. Uh, You've been writing about women in the workplace for many years. This is this has certainly been a passion for you. But but how did the No Club take shape? It it feels like it's different than than some of your past writings. Is that fair? Is that do you do you feel like it was different? I think it is fair. You know, as academics, you know, we report on research and and we we tell stories, but we never tell stories about ourselves. And so this book is super personal for all of us. We document our journey as a, a, you know, our decade long journey as a club. We tell some really revealing and personal stories in the book. And I got to say, we're all really nervous <laughs> about that. <laughs> you know, we, we think we did it because it was so important to us to get the message across. And we felt that that was one way we could do it by sharing our struggles, as well as all the struggles we heard from so many people we talk to, but it is, it's a weird book in that it is highly personal and uncomfortable. And maybe that's good. I will tell you that in reading the book, those personal stories, the, the piece that, I mean, just even the beginning where you're talking about the first, you know, I can't say no time to get together pulls, it, it pulled me in at least. And it was really highlighting, not just that this is a issue, but it is an issue that has Uh, an impact that goes well beyond what I think you would get if it was just purely a research kind of talking about here. Those stories make it real, you know? Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, You know, like I say, we're all, we're all pretty stressed out. Yeah, You shouldn't be nervous. You should actually be, be, you know, reveling in that because I think it really makes the book stand out. Yeah, at least here. I mean, this is a pretty safe space. (laughs) We've got your back. Let let me put it that way. Um, (laughs) If 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 it's okay, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to to turn over to uh, to ask you a couple of musical questions. I know that you are a big music fan. Uh, you're a dancer, so music goes hand in hand with that. But if you were to be stuck on a desert island for a year, now heaven forbid all the consequences that go along with that. But let's I'm say hoping that- to be stuck on a desert island for a year. That'd be awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, may your greatest wishes come true. Uh, what two musical artists? catalogs would you take with you? You could take everything that, that this artist has created. What, what, what two musical artists would you take with you? Well, for me, music is an opportunity to dance. And so it has to be danceable music. So, um, and this is going to reveal my odd musical taste. I would say the Rolling Stones and Bruno Mars. So it gets sort of different genres, but all danceable. Yeah. I was going to say, that's not, that doesn't seem that, I mean, they're, they're kind of different, but both of them are fantastic artists and they have great music. So. Well, I, I was asking my husband that question this morning because I knew you were going to ask me to it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> His answer was the Mountain Goats. And I don't know their, their music. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm. I'm really surprised because you and I have talked about Earth, Wind, and Fire in the past, and and how you know in the, there was a period of time where they were actually writing songs to 120 beats per minute for the very purpose of being danceable. Um, I think Bruno Mars has now replaced that for me. Wow! Yeah. Wow! 
Okay. Any Super favorite Bruno cool. Mars tunes? Is there, is there any uh, any song or it, it, just just out of curiosity if anything comes to mind? It's a little embarrassing. Um, 24 Karat Magic. <laughs> 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 oh, you and my daughter would get along really good. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, I think I told you guys before, my husband tells me I have the musical taste of a 13-year-old. So <laughs> She's 12. There you go. It, it fits in perfectly. There, there, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. That's that's pretty terrific. Um, can you can you listen to music while you work? Absolutely not, because music is for dancing, and you can't dance and work at the same time. It's very hard. So no, hard, hard to I write that, that hard that's to write the, that research paper when you're up and and kind of you know feeling the groove, right? Bob yeah. Marad. I guess if it was the mountain goats in the background, I could probably work. <laughs> <laughs> I would not. I would tune it out. <laughs> I'm sorry to the mountain goats, but it's just not my genre. You know, I, I love being exposed to all kinds of new music when we talk to to guests. You know, they always bring up something interesting. But Mountain Goats is – I've never heard of the Mountain Goats. Oh, so. um, w- listen to their song Golden Boy Peanuts. Golden Boy Peanuts. Okay. Okay. It will be we'll, – we'll actually uh, make a link in the show notes for anybody to listen to, to Golden Boy Peanuts. peanuts. <laughs> You're going to like it. <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. Linda Babcock, this has been an absolute treat. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Behavior Grooves today. It was really fun. Have me back. We, we will. And and I think you have uh, reached that part where every time it just is a little bit better. So we're, we're making that George uh, piece of this that Uh-oh. the third time <laughs> is, is, you know, better than the previous two, which were already fantastic. So thank you. All right. I'll try. <laughs> Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation with Linda, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our non-promotable brains. Oh, thank you. We have to we have to start with non-promotable tasks. It's got to be about NPTs. This right? is this is an amazing insight that shouldn't be an insight at all. It should just be <laughs> right, one of these right. things that we go, you look around just going, yeah, that's what happens. But we don't. And what I love is that Linda just brings Linda and her co-authors, right? It's not just Linda. It is Linda and and, and the co-authors that, that wrote this book highlight this and highlight it in a manner that just brings this front and center because it's too easy to just look at that and we don't even notice it, right? That's the problem. We don't even see it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as she says, a ton of feathers is still a ton. <laughs> like, like, let's just, let's just acknowledge what? that no feathers we... don't weigh anything. <laughs> they're, they're light as a feather. It's like that, you know, like that fourth grade joke, you know, which is heavier, a pound of bricks or a pound of feathers. Yeah. You know, it's like we, especially leaders in general, in general, missing the big point here. Uh, and because these, these tasks are invisible, and we are not. We haven't done a good job of setting them up to this point. I feel like this is really revolutionary kind of research that Linda and her colleagues have done. And, and the fact that we default to these NPTs, that women are the default to these, yeah. whether yeah. that's the expectation from men, it's also the expectation from other women, right? Yeah. This is this is not. This is just. It's kind of the the cultural ecosystem that we've grown up in again, and it becomes invisible. It becomes something that you don't see. And even the research that she did showing like, hey, you know, let's push the button in this situation. And when you push the button, when you have a male and female, who pushes the button? Women do more than half the time, right? More than half the time, right? Way more than half the time. Way more than half the time, which is just crazy when you think about it they should you you shouldn't be volunteering for these unless it is something that you really want to do or it's a promotable task not just because of your gender it it all boils down to expectations that we all have this agreed upon expectation that women are just going to do it and we are and organizations are suffering Academic organizations, corporations, nonprofits suffer because of it by not equally distributing uh, the NPTs to a wide variety of people. Right. Because, you know, we're just missing out on this. You're not getting the full insight, the full creativity, the full productivity of the entirety of the organization because you're overburdening uh, a certain subgroup with a ton of feathers. And it's still a ton right. of feathers. Right. Right. And, and 
this, I wanted to ask you about this because I thought this was the even beyond just this fact that we we burden you know women with this more often than we do men. Women of color have that particular, yeah. as Linda talked about, uh, it's even worse for them. Yeah, I loved how she brought up this term cultural taxation. You know, I mean, Linda's a labor economist by training. And so as she thinks about sort of life in economic terms, and it's a tax on ethnicity to think that women of color are paying a heavier price, you know, for these NPTs. And I think that that's just uh, it's again, it's really great that we're getting some light shed on this so that we can do something about it. Leaders have to do something about it. That, yeah. That's kind of the, the big deal there. And I like the the point that you say that light is being shed on this, that if we don't study these things, we won't see the tragic impact. And if we don't yeah. see that impact, we won't take corrective action. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about uh, the advice for women? The, the, the things that Linda brought up. Uh, love, it, love it. Love uh, it. I mean, and, and again, reiterate, this is not a fix the women issue, right? but there right. are things that women can do in order to help themselves. But, you know, this idea, you know, look, help the requester. Somebody's asking you to do yeah. something. It's a, it's, they don't care uh, uh, if who does it t- typically, it just needs right. to get done. So help them. I like that. I like this idea of finding someone else to do that task, someone who hopefully isn't a, a, another woman, but where that task isn't a NPT, where that task could actually be a promotable yeah. task, where, you know, different roles in different organizations, different things get counted for when you're looking at what you've done over the past quarter, the past semester, the past year. And those are the types of things that if you can if you can bring that over to somebody or just their tenure with the organization, somebody starting yeah. out, these things might have more value for them. And so think about that and not just taking on that responsibility yourself, but thinking about who can benefit from doing this task. Yeah. If you're, if you as an individual are jonesing for the chief party planning officer role at some point <laughs> in your career, great. Plan all the damn parties, you know, because those become promotable. That becomes part of your story, your your CV. Go ahead and do that. But if you're an you know an accounts payable, party planning isn't going to help your your job rating. It just it just isn't. I, I also like the idea of do a trade. Uh, I thought that that was just like okay, you know, I, I'll do this, but at the same time. Uh, Mr. Ms. Boss, you need to help me with taking something off my plate because it's going to take some time. Yeah. And and that's going to that might change my objectives. That might, you know, there's going to be ripple effects to this. I, I thought that that was really good that she called that out as a, as a tip. Yeah. And then the other idea of like, let's not do this alone. We we work right. in a community. So share the task with someone. I thought that was that was another really great idea. But I think, yeah. again, this isn't a fix the women issue. This is a mm-hmm. fix the organization. And we need to stop the backlash for women when they do say no. And we also need to stop the inherent kind of likelihood that women are going to be volunteered or voluntold or yeah. just, you know, said, here is what you need to do. So we need to stop that. And so I loved that piece of this. So it might start within your organization because I, I can imagine there's leaders who are listening are like, oh, no, no, that's that's not me. That's not my company that we don't do that. We'll collect some data. Right. Get started with collecting some data. Yeah. And I, I loved when she said, look, we did. We collected data. And when we did, we found that women are spending 200 more hours per year than men doing wow. NPTs. So wow. let's just 200 hours a year. Ah, oh, that's yeah, that's a lot. Right. That's five weeks of work. That's five full 40 hour weeks of work. That's a, that's over a month. It's over that's 10% of your entire work, work year. Oh my God. That's over a month. So, all right, I'm not going to do work for five weeks. I'm going to, I'm not going to do any of my work for five weeks. Um, and you are going to, and you're going to say, that's great. You know, is that, is mm-hmm. no, no, that's not how we do this. So of course, women are going to be held back because of that if they are the ones who are constantly taking this on. So we have to yeah. make that more equitable. And it's not saying that women are going to not do any NPTs, but no. you want to make sure that men and women and women of color and men of color uh, are doing it equitably. 
and it might not be everybody gets a hundred hours here, but at least it's it's not two hundred more. It's it's ninety hours for one person, and it's a hundred and three hours for another person, and it's you know yeah. ninety eight hours for the other person, and that should be equitable across the board. Agreed. I, I liked Linda's tips, uh, starting with something just as simple as let's just draw names from a hat. Let's just make it random. Don't ask well, for volunteers because what yeah. happens? People push the button more when they're, you know, <laughs> no, quit asking for volunteers. Just pick right. names or put or if it's something that happens like I like this other thing is, look, if it's something that happens all the time, just put it on a rotation. All right. Yeah. It's the yeah. it's the, you know, monthly happy hour. All right. All right. It gets on a rotation on who plans it. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. This month, it's Tim. Next month, it's Mary. Third month, it's Kurt. Right. Then it goes <laughs> Tim, Mary, Kurt. Now, granted, you know, I'm going to have the best happy hour planning of all of you guys. But, you know, that's that's how that goes. Uh, well, uh, let the, uh, you know. Proof is in the pudding. We'll just have to see <laughs> how that works. Okay. I, I like the idea, but you got some stiff competition here. Buddy. All right. All right. Yeah. What else? <laughs> what about, well, um, changing the way we reward work, right? How about, how about again, kind of getting back to the, and, and I was being sarcastic about the chief party planning officer, but how about looking for people in the organization where we can change NPTs to PTs, like change it from a non-promotable task to a promotable task? How about that? Right. The the idea that we can reallocate the work so that it is some, it, it is promotable or this is the big piece that I find interesting, right? It, it requires us to think differently about what makes a company hum because we tend to reward those things that we think make the company productive and profitable and all of those. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there has been a misplaced emphasis on some of the hard things, the sales, the revenue, the output, the productions, the costing, those types of things. And they're important. Don't get yeah. me wrong. Those are all important. But what we're missing is the soft side of, of business, the, the cultural glue that holds things together, this idea of building relationships, of building trust, of providing these mental cognitive breaks so people don't get burnt out, the ensuring compliance or making sure that the systems are are running smoothly and that we're doing all of these things that don't in a straightforward, you know, A leads to B end up improving sales or productivity or any of those other things, but are vital to that overall long-term success of the organization. Yeah. I, in fact, I would want to frame it in terms of things like uh, sales and profits are very downstream measures. Mm -hmm. They're almost like lagging indicators. They're not at the top of the, they're, they're not at the top of the food chain. What's just, as you said, what's at the top of the food chain, what actually is getting and driving things like profits and, um, and sales has to do with culture. It has to do with with how people relate to each other. Is it a psychologically safe environment? Are people um, empowered to actually speak up in their team meetings to offer better ideas, to to challenge, and to bring their whole selves to work? Those are the things that that really are the upstream indicators that lead to organizations to become not just better places to work, but also more effective organizations. So I like to think about it, Tim, and I think you just highlighted this: good culture equals good business oh, yeah. and good culture is run by what we currently consider NPTs, these non-promotable, you know, oh, the yeah. things, right? The, the this, yeah. uh, you know, so the idea here is that we need to change that. We need to think about these NPTs no longer the, being PTs, right? You know, this is, this is what, you know, we need to do here. And, yeah. and with that, We've written this whole book and other things on leading human and this idea that to build a good culture, you need to lead with the human element front and center. This idea mm -hmm. that, as you said, the results, the productivity, the sales, the whatever you're, else you're measuring are lagging in, in you know, effects, that we have the inputs that are up front that are all about humans, the creative, even if it's something that, you know, you look at 
tech companies or you look at, you know, manufacturing companies and you go, well, how is that? That's no, this is all about, you know, this. No, you need to have those human elements up front from the creativity, from the design, from the way that you're working in a team environment. All of those need to be really well oiled in order to make sure that the company runs well and that you're improving and moving on. Because they matter. They absolutely matter. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Yeah, thanks for bringing up Leading Human, Kurt. All right. Well, Groovers, I think it's time we wrapped up this episode. And with a huge, huge thank you to Linda for sharing her insights with us. We always, always enjoy speaking with her. And this time, no different. (laughs) No different. (laughs) Agreed. Agreed, Kurt. Um, And while the men listening to this episode might be tempted to buy a copy of the book for their wives or girlfriends or mothers or daughters, which is a fine idea. It's a fine idea. Totally cool. We also want you to buy a copy of the book for the men in your life who can benefit from some education. We need to alert organizational leaders of all shapes and sizes that too many NPTs on one person's plate leads to work work imbalances and reduces overall productivity. Yeah, this is a really important piece and we 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 actually even had a little conversation about this ourselves when we were yes. thinking because it is until you start to pay attention, these things go under kind of the radar. We don't notice totally. them. And we thought about like, how are we in- including, you know, it's, it's you, me, and then we have Mary and, and are we right. including her as an equal component in all of this? And, and so we, we have to take attention, pay attention to that and understand all of this. And yeah, it's, we agree that the only person who actually benefits from being, uh, or having a successfully planned a uh, holiday party is if that is their full-time job as an, a, a, a party planner, right? right. but that is right. still an important job. It's the planning of the happy hours, which again, yes. I will take you on any day as the better happy hour planner. <laughs> but if this task falls on someone whose regular job, you know, that party planner, if it falls on somebody whose regular job is to manage accounts payable or a QA specialist on an agile team, then the party planning role needs to be rotated so it doesn't yes. end up on an as another NPT in her to-do list. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and by the way, if you want to learn more about what leaders can do to manage their teams during these chaotic times, check out the guidebook that Kurt and I were just referencing called Leading Human. Uh, it's a workbook with a companion playbook on how leaders can up their games on dealing with the more human side of leadership, as we as we just talked about here a minute ago. And you can find it all on the behavioralgrooves.com website. Yes, please check it out and keep this conversation with Linda in mind as you think about how how tasks are being doled out on your team this week. And with that, we hope you carry these ideas with you as you go out this week and find your groove. 